and I'm honored to introduce our next speaker because he's someone who's been leading the fight to save this nation. Ben Shapiro started his march towards liberty at a young age. He became a nationally syndicated columnist at age 17 and wrote his first book at age 17 while he was attending UCLA. He continued his education at Harvard Law School and then made the wise choice not to enter the legal profession. He's since written for and been a commentator on just about every conservative publication, radio show, and TV show you can imagine. And he's written a few books in the sp his spare time, including recently, The People vs. Barack Obama, The Criminal Case Against the Obama Administration. He also spoke here two years ago, and his video of that speech is the most viral, the most watched video in the history of the Western Conservative Summit. Folks, please give a warm Colorado welcome to Ben Shapiro. Al Sharpton, say hello to Ben Shapiro. Good, hello, good morning, Ben. Hi, how are you? Fine. Have you guys ever met or spoken before? Uh, no, I haven't, and I, I'd like to uh, just ask Mr. Sharpton exactly why he's not paying for the Swan and Browley case and also uh, why he incited riots against Jews in Crown Heights. As we move forward in American society, the only thing that's going to cure the ills that we have is looking at some of the real problems straight in the face. Toughen up, you spoiled brat snowflakes. The, the idea for the left is that all inequality is evil, Therefore, the people who are unequal at the top are evil, and the people at the bottom are virtuous. You weren't a better person when you're poor. And no one is a better person just because they're poor. And by the way, no one's a better person because they're rich. Arguing with people on the left is sort of like trying to nail jello to the wall. You have to be ready to punch back twice as hard. Facts don't care about your feelings. If you don't want to be permanently poor in the United States, you need to do three things and three things only. Graduate high school, get a job and hold it, don't have a baby before you're married. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, conservative superstar, Ben Shapiro. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for waiting until after Sabbath for me. That's why it's so late. I really appreciate it. What you didn't know is that by doing that, by waiting till like 9.30 at night, you're all Jewish now, so congratulations. Everyone hates you and win for the Hebrews. <clears throat> so tonight, I want to talk a little bit about the divisions splitting conservatives from one another. We are four months from a presidential election pitting the most corrupt, manipulative, self-obsessed Democrat in America against Hillary Clinton. I'm joking, but not really. This election pits two of the most unpopular people in the country against each other, Hillary Clinton who is a lifelong corrupt criminal, a pathetically self-serving, ambitious, vile, rapist defender, a congenital liar, a felon, who despises founding principles and traditional notions of decency, against Donald Trump, who's an arrogant, a-religious, anti-constitutional, ignorant, big government, ad hoc panderer, who gave Hillary money. Now, now, hey, I'm not here to be popular. Now, there are some conservatives who say, that we should vote for Trump to stop Hillary. I by the way, I have total sympathy for this position. I really do, I have lots of sympathy for this position. I absolutely respect and understand the position of those conservatives who say they have to stop Hillary, although personally I think it's gonna take Dorothy with a bucket of water to do that. Hillary will certainly stack the Supreme Court with hardcore leftists who are going to gut First Amendment protections for speech and religion and Second Amendment protections of gun rights and Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable search and seizure and Fifth Amendment protections of due process rights and Tenth Amendment states' rights. She's going to continue President Obama's foreign policy of setting the world on fire, putting the fire out with battery acid and then setting the world on fire again. She's going to tear down our churches. She'll use the educational system to destroy basic concepts like the traditional family. She'll raise taxes. She'll craft new and ugly regulations. She'll open the borders. And she'll try to make sure that everyone who comes in illegally becomes a citizen. Overall, she will be the second worst president of all time after the current jackass who runs the place. So. Now that said, that said, there are other conservatives, including me, by the way, who have said that conservatism is in danger of slaughtering its principles on the altar of Trump. Trump is personally gross. He's a man who brags about having sex with other men's wives and never wanting to repent. He's got totalitarian instincts. 
He says protesters ought to be punched or carried out on stretchers. He wants to personally target people like Jeff Bezos because he owns the Washington Post and also owns Amazon.com. He plays footsie with bigotry. He goes easy on denouncing the KKK on national TV. He doesn't denounce his online anti-Semitic alt-right racists. He yells about Mexican judges and disabled journalists and POWs and women bleeding from their wherevers and says that his political opponent's wives are ugly and that his political opponent's fathers try to assassinate JFK. He stands against a strong foreign policy. He says he'd order our soldiers to target the families of jihadis in violation of both decency and law. He says the chief functions of the federal government include, and he said this, housing and health care. He flip-flops on abortion and guns and religious freedom and everything else. He says he'll refuse to take moral sides in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He embraces nonsense economics, like protectionism and tariffs. He doesn't care about the Constitution at all, because he's never read it, because he's written more books than he's read. He's ignorant. He revels in the ignorant. He was a Democrat until almost literally five minutes ago. He's a scam artist and a bully and a coward. Here's the problem, okay? Some conservatives are justifying all this garbage in order to boost him to victory. You can hold your nose and vote Trump. I get it. I might do the same thing, but do not justify perversions of your ideology, versions of your principles. Don't justify the perversion of your principles in order to justify your support for him. You want to hold your nose and vote Trump? Go ahead and do it. You want to destroy conservatism, conservatism in order to do it? Please don't. Now, there are some people, there are some people who are celebrating the garbage heap that is Donald Trump in order to boost him to victory. They're calling anybody with questions a thumb sucker. They're telling conservatives to shut up and sing along with the orange God King worship choir. They're calling any conservative who worries about corruption of conservatism a Republican against Trump, an RAT, a rat. People like this, the people who celebrate Trump, not the people who are just voting and holding their noses, the people who celebrate Trump and pretend he's a conservative and try to pervert conservatism to fit Donald Trump, those people are sellouts for Trump. They're S-O-F-T, soft. Those people, by the reason, are the way that this Never Trump movement even exists in the first place, because there's an idea that the people willing to sell out conservatism for victory are going to destroy both victory and conservatism. But here's a serious question for conservatives, because this is the question that I always get asked whenever I say this stuff. So I've just laid out a bunch of horrible decisions in a row, and it really is. I mean, there really isn't a fantastic decision here. I mean, it's hard not to be enthusiastic about an election going in. I know, I've lived through enough of them, not as many as some folks, but I mean, you want to be enthusiastic going into an election. So what do you do? I think the first thing that we need to do as conservatives, as conservatives, is recognize a basic truth. Conservatives have already lost this election. Okay, we now have a couple of bad choices in front of us, some really bad choices in front of us. One may be much worse than the other, by the way. But conservatism already lost. So here's the real question. How do we start over and build this thing up from the beginning? Because we hear from a lot of the speakers, and I think, of course, they're right, that the same thing, we lost, and we need to fight. So here's, so my goal tonight is to talk about how to actually rebuild a movement that's going to be able to combat all the evils that the left wants to pursue. So I want to get a little bit practical about it, because usually it's a little bit vague. So for me, building the movement, building the conservative movement is a four-step process. So step one is pretty obvious from what I've said already. We have to know our own values. One of the great lies of all time, the lie that's promulgated by the left, is the idea that diversity is our strength. Diversity of life experience, diversity of knowledge, that's, that's great. Diversity of values is our weakness. We have to join together under the banner of the values that we share. Sociologist Robert Putnam, he's a, he's a leftist, and he believed strongly in the notion that diversity is our strength. And then he did the research, and he found, quote, the only two things that go up as the diversity of your census tract goes up are protest marches and television watching. But there was one thing that brought people of all types together, all races, all creeds, all religions. What brought everybody together was common values. So he visited an ethnically diverse religious community, and here's what he said. He said, some other shared identity trumped their ethnicity. They weren't thinking of themselves sitting there as I'm black, or I'm white, or I'm pink, or yellow. They were thinking about their relationship with, in that case, with God. Here's what our common value is. Defense of Western civilization. Okay, we're a band of brothers. We are. And that band of brothers is not separated by race or ethnicity, and it's not separated by racialism or tribalism. America isn't one nation for blacks, and it's not one nation for whites. Barack Obama said the same stuff, but he certainly didn't mean it. Right? It's a nation that we hold together in common, and it's a nation that's built on values. And if we really want to make America great again, if we really do, that doesn't happen unless you know what made America great in the first place. 
It doesn't happen by handing over power to any one figure who you think is going to win for you. It happens by understanding what did make America great in the first place. And that's very simple. Individual liberty guaranteed by a limited government that draws its legitimacy from a moral and religious people. When I say liberty, I don't mean libertinism. It doesn't mean take all my property, let the government run roughshod over me, just let me smoke my dope and put my genitals where I want. That's what the left seems to think liberty means. Liberty means the notion you have rights that were given to you by nature and nature's creator and nobody has the right to bother you so long as you're not bothering anybody else. That's what liberty means. And what liberty and government means, this doesn't mean no government, it's not anarchy. It does mean a government that is not empowered to guarantee you stuff. It's there to protect you from others who want to take your stuff. It's also not there to make you feel better about your same-sex marriage, make you feel honored. It's also not there to make you feel better about your abortion. That's not what government is there to do. It's not there to protect you from big gulps, and it's not there to protect you from Leviticus. Right, limited government is there to protect you from people who are trying to violate your rights. And when I say we draw our legitimacy from a moral and religious people, this is the most important aspect. This doesn't mean everybody has to be a Bible believer. It does mean, it also doesn't mean that religious people are all moral or that all moral people are non-religious. But what it means is that Judeo-Christianity, the Judeo-Christian values are the basis for civilization. Respect for others because we're all created in God's image. Rule of law because we're all equal before God. Building healthy families because that's our purpose on the planet. That's what creates the social fabric that allows us to live together and leave our front doors unlocked at night. That's the whole deal. That's who we are. So those are the values that we stand for. So step two, now we know our values. Know your enemy. Okay, this is where I think the Republican Party has fallen dramatically short. This is where conservatives have fallen dramatically short. The conservative movement is absolutely moribund. We're falling apart and we don't even know why. And the reason is simple. We've, we've lost our mission. Our mission has been lost. In 1940, George Orwell was writing about why Hitler had such a draw among young people. Why was Hitler so popular? After all, it meant you had to live basically in barracks. Living conditions in Germany weren't that great. You were marching through other people's countries. Like what was the real draw of Nazism? What was the draw of Hitler? And here's what he wrote. It's, it's one of the most profound quotes, I think, of the 20th century that nobody knows. He wrote, Hitler has grasped the falsity of the hedonistic attitude to life. Nearly all Western thought since the last war, certainly all progressive thought, has assumed tacitly that human beings desire nothing else beyond ease, security, avoidance of pain. In such a view of life, there's no room, for instance, for patriotism and the military virtues. Whereas socialism and even capitalism in a more grudging way have said to people, I offer you a good time, Hitler has said to them, I offer you struggle, danger, and death, and as a result, a whole nation flings itself at his feet. Hitler offered people mission, in other words. ISIS offers its foot soldiers mission, which, by the way, is why you see people who grow up in the West going and joining ISIS, because they offer them a mission, it makes them feel like their life is worthwhile, even if they're doing tremendously evil things, things for which they will burn in eternal hell. Right? They feel that they have a mission. It's a mission, just like Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders offers to his dope-smoking, unemployable supporters. So the question is, what mission are we going to offer Americans to counter these evils? Here's the mission, fighting those evils. And that requires knowing the evil. Right? All revolutionary movements exist in opposition. The founding movement didn't exist in a vacuum. It existed in opposition to a British tyrannical monarchy. It, it existed in opposition to the notion that a ruling elite given power by God, could determine the course of their lives. That's why the nation they founded was built in opposition to that. Everything they wrote was in opposition to that. So what do we now exist in opposition to? What do we oppose? And the answer right now is nothing. And this is why the Republican Party has failed since 1988. In 1988, we lost our way. And the reason is because for literally decades, the opposition was the Soviets. Right? We made the argument that the worst people in the world and the people we had to fight were the Soviet communists. And so republicanism existed in opposition to that. That's what defined the three legs of the Republican stool. Social conservatism to keep our families strong and keep our economy growing. Fiscal, conservative to fiscal conservatism to make sure we could outcompete the Soviets. Foreign policy hawkishness to check Soviet ambitious, ambition. Then the Soviet Union falls, right? And the Republican Party lost its enemy, which is when Democrats start to win. Why did Democrats start to win at that point? Because Democrats have always known their enemy, the people in this room. The Democrats have always thought that we were their enemy, not the Soviets. They've always hated us more than they hated ISIS. Hillary Clinton was asked on a debate stage, who are your enemies? She said Republicans. She was right. That's exactly right. Her, her face opened and soul-sucking sounds of her voice came out, and she said the truth. 
So right now, the Republicans say, vote for us, and we will fight ISIS, or we'll fight Europeanism, or we'll fight something. Right? Well, we don't know what it is. We'll fight something. We'll fight the establishment, which is a meaningless term. Okay, when Ted Cruz ends up in the establishment, the term means nothing. Okay, the, but, the, but the fact is that they, we, we say we're going to fight all sorts of things, but we don't, we're not really clear on what this is. The left has always been clear the right is the enemy. So whenever, whenever people tend to vote, and people tend to support the people whose enemies they also want to fight. So yes, of course, ISIS is our enemy. But the, here's the truth. The left is more dangerous than ISIS. The reason the left is more dangerous than ISIS is because ISIS can't succeed without their appeasement and help. Right? ISIS, President Obama was wrong when he labeled them the JV team because he promptly made them the non-JV team. Right? The fact is that the left is behind the rise of ISIS. Right? It doesn't matter. They, they, they can't destroy us without the left helping them along. They, they can't. They can't without the left pretending radical Islam doesn't exist or releasing transcripts of jihadist phone calls with the religion and, the, and, and Allah omitted. Right? They can't destroy us without Obama removing troops from Iraq and slashing the military or Hillary Clinton declaring war in Libya and then, and then leaving Americans to die in Benghazi because she's a vicious pile of nastiness piled five foot seven high. Right? The fact is that the left, if, if you're not fighting the left, you're doing it wrong. So if, if we say that ISIS is, is our worst enemy, that's not true. Leftism is our worst enemy because they're the ones who are going to allow ISIS to win. The left wants to destroy our families. Marx said it openly. The family is the basis of a free civilization because I care more about my child than I care about your child. And presumably you feel the same way. You don't know my kid's name. The left wants to get rid of the family by telling mothers they don't need fathers, by telling mothers it's virtuous to kill their own babies. Right, by telling everybody the government can raise their children better than they can. The left wants to destroy our, our churches because they want to play God, and God keeps getting in the way of their agenda. The left wants to divide each other based on race, so they can destroy our unity in the name of diversity and pit us against each other, and then tell us, as Obama did, that government is the only thing we hold in common. That was an actual slogan at the 2012 DNC. These are our enemies, and we have to fight them. That's our mission in life. Which takes us to the practical, step three. So how do we go about fighting them? Okay, one reason that Donald Trump won the primaries, and maybe the one, one thing I like about Donald Trump, is, is because of one phrase, basically, he fights. Right? People feel like he fights, which is true. Now, lots of people made fun of this he fights routine with Trump. I made fun of it, too, because I think that Trump fights for his own priorities, not for the Constitution or the Declaration or conservatism, and that he runs from conflict on issues that really matter because he's trying to be popular. But there was the impression that he fights. He, and, he, and he does, he fights. Right? It might not be always the right people. As I've said from the very beginning, Donald Trump is a hammer in search of a nail. Sometimes when he hits a nail flush, it's really satisfying. Sometimes he hits a puppy. And you don't know which it's going to be. But here's the thing. Conservatives want to fight. They just don't know how, which is why they picked the guy who wields the hammer that often hits puppies. Every four years, conservatives wake up to the fact that a presidential election is coming. They think to themselves, who's going to be, who's going to be the savior? Who's going to save us? Who's going to ride in on the white horse and clock somebody? Right? We have jobs, we have families, we have lives, we have things to do. We don't do the movement thing for four years. We show up once every four years, and then we pick the guy we think fights the hardest, and then he either wins or loses, and we go back to our families, and then we sort of ignore what's going on. We act like we're going to remain prosperous and free just because we're here, as though if, if the left implements Venezuela's policies, we'll still be okay because, hey, we're America. Well, we're not going to stay America without a fight, and enthusiasm is not going to cut it. Certainly not enthusiasm every four years. When George Washington took over the Continental Army, he said, the course of human affairs forbids an expectation that troops formed under such circumstances should at once possess the order, regularity, and discipline of veterans, but whatever deficiencies there may be will, I doubt not, soon be made up by activity and zeal of the officers and docility and obedience of the men. Anybody who reads the history of the Revolutionary War knows that George Washington never ended up making those statements true. Right? The rest of the war he complains about how nobody knows how, what they're doing. Right, so zeal and enthusiasm are going to make up for it. So that means we have to know the tactics of our enemies. So here's where it gets fun. Saul Alinsky laid out all the tactics of our enemies. Right, Saul Alinsky basically had 12 rules. And I'm going to go through them lickety split. We're going to go through them very quickly. And we're, going to, and we're going to teach how to destroy every one of these tactics from Saul Alinsky because this is how Obama does it. This is how Hillary does it. This is how the left does it. First, Alinsky says power comes not from what you have, from what your enemy thinks you have. This is true, of course. But it means that we should not take for granted everything the left says about its own power. They don't have power with the people. They assume we can't win blacks and Hispanics in large numbers because they say that. But we shouldn't believe them. We should go into black and Hispanic communities and flex our muscles everywhere we can and make our argument to every single person. Conversely, we should let them be intimidated by us. They're clearly intimidated by the NRA, and they should be. 
That's why the, the left sort of wakes up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, mumbling the letters NRA over and over for no reason. Right? The fact is that our impression of power is just as important as the power we hold. So we're constantly menting we don't have power. We should give the impression of power. Okay, second, Alinsky says never go outside the expertise of your people. So notice, the left only argues on grounds where they feel safe. This is why they always call you a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe. They don't know anything else. Right? It's all character attacks all the time. If you knock them off their pedestal, they don't know what to do. So just to take an example, last Sunday I, sp I was uh, speaking at another event and I was debating Sally Cohn from CNN. You may remember her as one of the ladies who did the hands up, don't shoot routine in the aftermath of Ferguson, which was based on a lie. And she was, her expertise is basically calling people a racist. It's what she's great at. And she is, she's, she's great. She pronounces the word racist beautifully. So, so she was saying that the criminal justice system is racist and terrible. And I said, no, it's not. And she said, well, then, but there's such a disproportionate number of, of black people in prison. First, first, first she called me a racist, and I said, no, your president's a racist. But after that, she said, the criminal justice system is racist. I said, no, it's not. And I said, let me ask you a question. She said, okay. I said, how many men are in prison as a percentage of the population? And she said, I don't know. I said, 92% of the people in prison are men. Why are they in prison? Is it because the system is, is sexist? And she said, no, it's because they commit all the crimes. And I said, right. In other words, the left has no expertise. Once you get past the racist argument, there's nothing for them to do. Third, Alinsky says you have to go outside the expertise of the enemy. You have to make people feel uncomfortable. We're, we're nice people, we don't like doing that. Learn to love it, it's fun. Make folks on the left feel uncomfortable. The left likes to use non sequiturs or coin new terms. The best way to, do, to avoid this is simply to tell them that they're speaking nonsense and drag them back to the issues. This is why if they say microaggressions, then you just say, I don't know what you're talking about, that sounds very stupid. Let's talk about, let, Let's talk about words that have meanings in the language I'm speaking English. Right. The fourth Alinsky rule is you have to make the enemy live up to its own book of rules. So this is where it matters to have an ideologically coherent movement, actually. So let's take, in, as an example, tax arguments. So the right says two things that conflict with one another. First, debt matters. Second, we want to lower taxes. So what the left does is they say, well, if you really cared about the debt, you wouldn't lower taxes, right? It creates more of a gap. So what we really should be saying, what we really should be saying is, no, you don't understand. We want tax revenue to go down so we can slash the spending. Right? We, the, we shouldn't be making the argument, the Laffer curve argument. It's actually not a, it, it, it's, it's a true argument, but it's not a valuable argument. The Laffer curve argument, if you lower tax rates, there are more government revenues. Last I checked, I don't want more government revenues. I want fewer government revenues. They're doing too much crap with my money already. Fifth point that Alinsky makes. Ridicule is, is human, humankind's most important weapon. If you can ridicule people into the ground, you can finish them off, right? The left loves to ridicule the, the right. This is why they worship at the altar of John Stewart. He makes us look dumb. So we have three choices. We can either take the hit and grin, we can school marm them, or which, which always fails. I mean, look what Jeb Bush tried to do to, to Donald Trump, school marming him on the stage. Oh, Donald, it's just so terrible what you're saying, and then Trump would put him through a wall, and everybody would laugh, right? Or we can mock the left mercilessly right to their faces. So when John Stewart mocks Republicans, they should tell him that he's a failed actor who has to rely on a live audience of chimpanzees in order to make him look funny. And that his movie sucked to boot, which is why nobody watched it. The reason that Trump won is because in part, he's a very funny guy. He actually is. Most of that's intentional, some of it's not, but he's very funny. And nobody knew how to stop funny, because it's very hard to stop funny. Six points, do stuff that your people enjoy. So, for instance, Democrats to fight gun control, they don't just go and try and pass bills or lobby their Congress people. They sit down like small children having a potty break in the middle of the Congress. Why? Because that's what they like to do. They like sitting there being paid to do nothing, so they go and they sit there and they're paid to do nothing and scream like children. Right? There's, there's stuff conservatives like to do too. So there's stuff that we say we like, and then there's stuff we actually like. So the stuff that we say we like is going out to the middle of parks and putting on funny wigs and tri-corner hats. That's the stuff that we say that we like. But we don't actually like to do that because it's really hot outside and those things are really itchy. What we really like to do, what we really like to do is be mischievous, because everybody likes to be mischievous. So when the Democrats sat down on the floor of Congress, there should have immediately been a movement to send them cushions. Right? We should have, we should have sent thousands and thousands of cushions to the Capitol building and said to them, look, sit there forever. Never leave. You're not doing anything right now and it's great. I want you to sit there and I want you to be like the, the, the supremely obese guy from the Daily Mail who like grows into his couch. Just sit there and grow into the floor of Congress. Seventh Alinsky tactic. 
Don't use the same tactics all the time. So the left keeps switching its tactics all the time, which makes it difficult to deal with. Our tactic is always write to your congressperson, call your congressperson. Sometimes we should do that. Sometimes we should just send Botox coupons to Nancy Pelosi's office. <laughs> Eighth Alinsky point. Never let up. He says this. He says the left will never let up. They don't pause. They don't take breaks. They push on every front. If you think they're not going to push further, they're lying. They're always going to push further. First, they said they wanted homosexual sex legalized. And we all said, fine, no one cares what you do behind closed doors. That's cool. And then they said, we want civil unions. And we said, OK, as long as you don't go for gay marriage. They said, we promise. We promise. We're totally not going to do gay marriage, guys. And then, and then we said, and then, and then they came back with gay marriage, and we said, well, you know, we're not so hot on this. We told you not to do this. They said, well, it's not going to affect your family. It's not going to affect you in any way. Then they came after all the businesses and said, you have to cater our same-sex weddings. Right? And now they say, we're not going to come after your church. They're always coming. They're always coming. And so the answer here is find your principle, stand on it, and do not budge under any circumstances, because the minute you give an inch, they will take a mile. Okay, ninth point that Alinsky makes. He says, the threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. So the left likes to threaten us with riots and with scorn, and they think it's supposed to make us feel bad. Thankfully, I have no capacity for shame, so it doesn't make a difference for me. Um, as an example of this, I don't know how many of you watch CNN Headline News. Show of hands real quick. Right, the answer is zero, which is their ratings. So I was on CNN Headline News with Dr. Drew, and he asked me to come on to, to do the Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, the, the, they were talking about Caitlyn Jenner uh, getting a, a heroism award from ESPN, right, for Caitlyn Jenner's great heroism in the battle at Normandy. And Caitlyn Jenner... So they, so they bring me in, and the producer, who, he says to me, you know, we want you, to, we want you to say everything that's on your mind. I said, do you really? And they said, uh -huh. and they said yeah, we'd love that. Our ratings are terrible. I said, right, I know. And they said, well, uh, he, he says, I'm a, I'm a producer for Jerry Springer. At this point, I should have known things were going to go wrong. Um, but they bring me in, and it, it's a panel of me, and I think it was one, two, three, four. I think it was six other people on the panel. So it was me against six people on the left, which makes it almost fair for them. So we're... So we're sitting there, and they sit me next to a transgender woman, meaning a guy who thinks he's a lady. And his name is, and his name is Zoe Turr. And so they go through this whole rigmarole at the very beginning of the debate, and, and they're talking about transgenderism. Is it, it, does Caitlyn Jenner deserve a Medal of Honor? Or conversely, does Caitlyn Jenner deserve actual sainthood direct from the Pope? Right? This was the conversation. And then they came to me, and I said, well, I don't see why Caitlyn Jenner deserves anything. Like, what did Caitlyn Jenner do? It's a dude with hormone treatments and some surgeries who has mental illness. And the, and the transgender guy sitting next to me, he, to make a long story short, he turns to me and he says, you don't know anything about, about science, little boy. I said, well, I know something about genetics. And every cell in Caitlyn Jenner's body has a Y chromosome, except, ironically, some of his sperm cells. And, and, this, and, so, this guy, and so this guy turns to me and, uh, and, he, and he keeps pushing me, keeps pushing me. And finally, I say, well, let me ask you, what are your genetics, sir? And it was the sir that set him off. He, he grabs me by the back of the neck. This is on national TV. He grabs me by the back of the neck, and he says to me, you saw a clip of it where I said facts don't care about your feelings in that little, that little video. This is part of the same debate. He grabs me by the back of the neck, and he says, if you don't cut that out, I'm going to send you home in an ambulance. Right? Which, number one, didn't make sense because you don't go home in an ambulance. But, the, but what was amazing is the left turns to me afterward, and they say that they all say, "How could you have offended Zoe that way? How could you have offended Zoe that way?" And, and here's the thing: I didn't care, so it didn't matter to me, and that's the point. The left thinks it can intimidate you into doing whatever it wants just by saying things, and it's not true. It's not true. By the way, Zoe Tor would later go on to threaten me and say, "I'll meet you in the parking lot," in a voice at least an octave lower than my own, and uh, and threaten to curb stomp me on Twitter, um, all of which I thought was deeply unladylike behavior. So, 10th Alinsky point, if you push a negative hard enough, it becomes a positive. The idea here is that if they're just gross enough and just horrible and offensive enough to elicit a response, they become the heroes. This is what Obama's done. He sort of trolled us all into insanity. Right now, he says anything, and we react because we know what he's really saying, but he acts like he's not saying that, and so we look crazy. So we, shouldn't, we, we should highlight what they're doing, but not overreact to it. So that takes a little bit of holding yourself back 
You know, just because Obama is horrible on radical Islam does not mean he's a Muslim. He's an atheist who's a leftist. Hillary Clinton believes the same things that he does. He just happens to be horrible all the way around. Well, so is she, so I guess they have that in common too. Okay, 11th point, have an alternative available. So the left always has a backup plan, but their backup plan is just a step toward their future plan. That's what Obamacare was, right? There was a backup plan, and the backup plan was Obamacare. Their original plan was fully nationalized health care. Understand this is their plan, right? Compromise from the left is not a compromise. It's a first step toward their final goal. Don't give them the compromise. Don't do it. <laughs> and then finally, the 12th Alinsky tactic is to, the one that we all know, right? Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, polarize it. Right? This is the famous one from Alinsky. Find somebody you don't like and then hit them and make them the bad guy. The left's job is to make individuals into villains they can attack. Don't let them. If somebody's a villain, you shouldn't associate with them anyway. You shouldn't defend villains. But if they're not, for goodness sake, don't run from people just because the left is attacking them. Defend the people who deserve defense. And by the way, the real villains are the lefties. So use this tactic against them because they deserve it. Okay, so that's step three is to know your enemy and their tactics. Final step, don't get fat and happy. Our army has to stay lean. That means that we can't sacrifice the nature of the army for temporary victory or we'll hollow out the movement. Okay, we've been doing this for years. Compromise is fine, it is, so long as you remember where you left your principles. But if you left them somewhere and you don't remember where you left them, you're never gonna find them again. And you'll end up with no victory and no principles. So we have to stay lean and stay sharp and we have to be aware that when someone doesn't hold your principles and hold their feet to the fire, then nothing gets done. It's always easier to get in line, to go along, to say your army is the better of two evils. And it's true, it's always gonna be true. We're always gonna be the better of two evils. But that's not what builds movements. If you allow the army to lose its values, if you forget what you're fighting for in the first place, if you forget who your enemies are, then you forget how to fight and you become a spent force. No conservative movement can put up a series of candidates who, put up, who blew up the budget, created campaign finance reform, originated Obamacare, and gave money to Hillary Clinton all in a row and not hollow out the movement. You can't do that. Trump, victory, Trump may feel like victory in the same way that Napalm does. It's got the scent, but the actual substance might burn a little bit. Let me wrap up with this basic idea. How you vote in this election cycle is up to you. I get it. I understand. I may vote the same way you do in the end. Okay, how I vote is my business. But please, for the love of all that's holy, let's think about building a movement beyond this election cycle. Think about building something once we're past November. I'm 32. I'm 32 years old. Okay, I have a two-year-old. I've been busy in the last couple of years since I was last here. I have a two-year-old and I have a two-month-old. Those generations are only going to be protected if we rev revivify our movement. If we come together around those values, and if we learn who our enemies are, and if we fight them every single step of the way, never giving an inch, and if we never stop fighting, we can't get tired. If we do, they win. We can't let them have a few victories. They exploit every single victory and then push on to the next victory. The left is a ceaseless, heedless monstrosity. It's our job to hold that wall. Here's the thing, though. I think true conservatives know that. You know, Ronald Reagan always said this. He always said freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. And that's exactly right. But to avoid extinction, we have to grow. We have to evolve. We have to get stronger. We have to get tougher. We have to rededicate ourselves to the principle. We have to rededicate ourselves to the fight. And that's hard work. And that's our mission. We're an empire of liberty. We're a nation conceived in freedom. Our mission is to carry that freedom forward in the face of all odds, and that mission doesn't change, that mission is eternal. And that mission calls to us from the end of history. It's God's mission, it's the Founder's mission. It's a mission that has to be fulfilled at all costs. The mission calls us forward, it urges us forward. The heroes of days past, Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Lincoln and Reagan, our fathers, our mothers, our ancestors, who fought to bring us to these shores and then make these shores free and give their kids a chance, they're cheering us on, they are. They are, I believe in an afterlife, and they're cheering us on begging us to stumble forward because nobody else is going to carry the torch. The left's gonna try to rip that torch away. They're gonna try and drown it in the mud of political correctness, of collectivism, of government tyranny, and it's up to us. So, let's take up the torch, passed down to us over 2,000 generations. Let's take it up with joy in our heart and strength in our grip and a warning in our eyes, do not, for the love of God, cross us. We're the guardians of limited government and individual liberty. We're the guardians of Judeo-Christian Western civilization. There's no one else left. We're the last line of defense. We stand together, and we must never, ever, and we will not ever, ever stop fighting. Thanks so much.